Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Understanding Absolute Stoichiometry of Oligomeric Protein Complexes Using SecMOLs. I'm Rita Peters, Editorial Director of BioPharm International and the moderator for today's event. We're pleased to bring you this educational web seminar presented by BioPharm International and sponsored by Wyatt Technology. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Sheena Darcy, a tenure-track assistant professor at the University of Texas at Dallas, started there in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry in the fall of 2015. She completed her doctorate in the laboratory of Sir Professor Tom Blundell at the University of Cambridge in the UK, and her postdoctoral work in the HHMI laboratory of Professor Carolyn Luger at Colorado State University. Her laboratory uses the hybrid structural approach to characterize the structure, dynamics, and functional outcomes of protein interactions related to chromatin dynamics. Kurt Widget Sarkar is a graduate student that works in the Darcy Laboratory. He completed his bachelor's degree in technology with a specialty in biotechnology at the Valor Institute of Technology University. He established SecMOLs in the Darcy Laboratory and attended the Light Scattering University run by Wyatt. His doctoral studies focus on the characterization of the interaction between metazoan NAPs and histone acetyltransferases. So thank you for joining us. Dr. Darcy, please get us started. Today we're going to talk about how we used SecMOLs to determine the absolute stoichiometry of a protein complex. Now this was a challenging project as several members in the protein complex were known to oligomerize. This work was completed in my laboratory by my PhD student Prithwit Jitsaka, you're going to hear from him later, and my laboratory is located at the University of Texas at Dallas. We're interested in studying nucleosome assembly proteins or NAPs. NAPs are a family of histone chaperones which means they bind histones very tightly. Histones are the proteins responsible for packaging the DNA in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell. They do this by forming this protein DNA complex called the nucleosome. Shown here is the crystal structure of the nucleosome. In the center, we have multiple copies of histones, while on the outside, we have the DNA. By binding histones, NAPs are able to regulate the assembly and disassembly of the nucleosome. This is able to influence several activities in the cell, particularly the transcription of the DNA, the repair of the DNA, as well as the replication of the DNA. Studying NAP proteins can be a little bit challenging. This is because their constitutive dimers that are known to form tetramers in a salt-dependent manner. So shown here is the crystal structure of one NAP protein from yeast called VPS75. In orange, we can see one constitutive homodimer, and in white, we can see another constitutive homodimer. You can see in the crystal packing that they form this tetramer with this ring-like structure. This dimer tetramer equilibrium, however, is dynamic and depends on the concentration of salt in solution as well as the concentration of protein. We are interested in studying how NAP proteins interact with histones. So NAP proteins typically bind two different types of histones with very high affinity. One type of histone is called histone H2A, H2B, while another is called histone H3H4, and Prit will tell you more about them later. Shown here is the crystal structure of another NAP protein from yeast, yeast NAP1, bound to a single copy of histone H2A, H2B. Many people have studied yeast NAP1, and it's almost a model system for understanding how histone chaperones work. Despite that the, the presence of this crystal structure, debate still remains as to the absolute stoichiometry between a NAP protein and a histone. We have recently identified a new NAP ortholog in the worm, which we will call WormNAP1. 
We identified WormNAP1 by doing a BLAST-P search with the USENAP1 sequence. Crystallographic analysis has shown us that the high sequence similarity between WORM and USENAP1 is mirrored in high structural conservation, at least in the core domain. So shown here we have the crystal structure of WormNAP1, while over here we have the crystal structures of WORM and USENAP1 superposed. You can see their structural similarity is very obvious. What is not obvious, however, is the conservation, or lack thereof, of the domains outside of this core domain. Now, if we look at a sequence alignment, it is immediately apparent that YSNAP1 contains extra regions outside of this core domain. In particular, it contains this N-terminal tail and this C-terminal tail. Now, these tails are not present in the YSNAP1 structure, presumably because they're disordered. Now, these tails are very important because they're thought to play a role in histone binding, and they're very, very acidic. So this is opposite to the very, very basic nature of the histone proteins. Now, the new ortholog that we've identified, this worm ortholog, naturally lacks this N-terminal tail and has a much shorter C-terminal tail. It is thus a great you know, model system for us to test the role of these acidic tails in histone binding. With this newly identified NAP1 ortholog in hand, we set out to answer the following key questions. Firstly, how does ionic strength impact oligomerization of the NAP1 dimer? Secondly, do NAP1 histone complexes oligomerize? And thirdly, what is the absolute stoichiometry of NAP1 histone complexes? The key is that by comparing and contrasting yeast NAP1 to worm NAP1, we'll be able to determine the role of these disordered N and C-terminal tails in each of these events. In order to do this, we used an approach called SECMILS, and this is where I'll pass over to my student, as he's the one that did all of the hard work. Thanks, Sheena. So all of our questions can be answered using a technique called SECMAS, and I'll tell you what it is in a little bit. We are going to answer our first question by performing SECMAS of NAP1 at two different salts, 150 and 300 millimolar NaCl. Um, to study the NAP1 histone complex oligomerization, we are going to titrate histones H2A, H2B, or H3, H4 to our NAP1 and then process our data. And then to understand the absolute stoichiometry of NAP1 histone complexes, we are going to look at our observed data, compare it to our theoretical molecular weights, and make conclusions about stoichiometry, especially the stoichiometry of NAP1 and H3H4, where we are going to perform segments of a histone mutant called DMH3H4. But we'll get to that a little later. So what is SECMAS? SECMAS is size exclusion chromatography coupled to multi-angle light scattering. It is composed of two major components, the SEC part, which is labeled in blue, and then the MALS component over here, which is in green and red. The SEC component is comprised of an HPLC pump that drives our proteins and buffer to the SEC column. The size exclusion column then separates our proteins based on shape and size, and it enters a UV detector where we obtain a chromatogram based on the protein's absorbance. The chromatogram gives us the peak height, peak shape, and as well as the elution volume, so we get some information about our proteins in our mixture. But to get a more quantitative molecular weight, the samples pass into a light scattering detector. Our lab uses the Wyatt uh, Mini Don Treos, it is a three-angle light scattering detector which measures light scattering. And once that happens, our samples move into the RI or the refractive index detector, also by Wyatt. Uh, it is the OptiLab T-Rex system that we use in our lab. The RI detector measures refractive index and uh, gives us the concentration of our proteins similar to the UV. Now, all these systems are connected to a computer where we we collect 
visualize, process, and analyze the data. Uh, uh, we use the software called Astra, and it's a really user-friendly and simple software to use. Data processing on, on Astra takes about five to 10 minutes once you get the hang of it. Um, and that's basically the last component in our SecMulse setup. What is the principle of SecMulse? Let's dive into a little bit of detail of how these systems actually work. The first thing is SEC or size exclusion chromatography. This component separates our proteins or mixtures based on size and shape. Here, for example, you can see a chromatogram of a very nice pure protein. Probably doesn't have any other contaminating species, so you can just see a nice curve. It's plotted on the x-axis which shows us the elution volume and you can see that the elution volume is around 12 to 13 mils and the intensity of some form is on the y-axis. It could be UV but in our case it is a differential refractive index that's measured by the Wyatt Optilab T-Rex system. Once our proteins move through the chromatography system it enters into the light scattering system. Here, in the laser cell, a laser hits our samples as it passes through, and light is scattered in all directions. We have detectors in three different directions, um, which is in the mini Don Treos, and that will measure the molecular weight. It's calculated using this formula, where we have the light scattering measured by intensity, the concentration measured by our, our refractive index system, dn by dc, which is the refractive index increment, it is constant for all proteins, and we can use that to calculate the molecular weight. Once we get the molecular weight, we can actually plot it across the peak as this trace over here, and it is plotted on the right y-axis. So that is the breakdown of how we are going to analyze and interpret our data. Why did we choose SecMulse? From crystallography, you saw that WormNAP1 and eSnap1 are highly structurally similar, but we wanted to look at the differences and differences in solution. So we use SecMulse, which lets us do that. NAP proteins are dimers, but also oligomerized in a salt-dependent manner. So being buffer versatile was also another important factor we had to consider. SECMAS lets us run our samples at different buffers with different salts and pHs, so it was very important in our research. It also requires a low protein requirement, unlike other techniques like analytical ultracentrifugation, which requires 1 mL. SecMulse just requires 0.1 mils of sample at a really low concentration. Um, and an another important factor was that um, proteins did not need to be modified for SecMulse. Most techniques require some sort of mutation or a modification like a fluorescence tag, but SecMulse didn't need that and it was good because our protein was previously uncharacterized, the worm nap one, so we wanted to study it in its wild type state. Um, NAP proteins, um, since they form oligomers, it was great to visualize their heterogeneity using SecMulse and not only visualize it, but we could also quantitate it by getting a molecular weight for the peak across the peak. So we would understand the dynamic complexes um, at a very quantitative level. The data acquisition from SecMulse was really nice and fast and easy. Uh, it was straightforward and data processing literally took about 10 minutes after each run was done. Um, but the most important thing is that SecMulse let us visualize the absolute stoichiometry uh, as opposed to the relative stoichiometry. Absolute stoichiometry is the actual number of proteins in a complex, say four NAPs bound to two histones or four to two complex. Whereas relative stoichiometry is just the ratio, so it would say just two to one. And um, SecMulse actually let us get the hard set actual stoichiometry, which was uh, which sets it apart from most other techniques.
Let's talk about the research now. First, let's talk about the oligomerization of the NAP dimer. We know that NAP proteins are constitutive homodimers, shown in orange. But these proteins have a tendency to oligomerize, especially from tetramers, in a salt-dependent manner. Using SECMALS, we will study the oligomeric states of warm NAP1 and yeast NAP1 at different ionic strengths. Before we look into the data, let me walk you through the experimental design. First, we take 20 micromolar of NAP1 and inject it into a column pre-equilibrated with 300 millimolar NaCl. We get a black trace here um, of the SEC profile and the MALS value is plotted on the right y-axis. We repeat the same experiment, but instead of using 300 millimolar NaCl, we inject our NAP1 over a column pre-equilibrated with 150 millimolar NaCl, and we get a gray trace, and as well as another MALS trace over here. We can then compare um, the observed molecular weight traces to the theoretical molecular weight of NAP1. The theoretical molecular weight of NAP1 dimer is about 100 kilodalton, the tetramer being a little above 200 kilodalton. So once we get those values, we compare our observed molecular weight, which is for yeast NAP1, 104.8 kilodalton, and compare it to the theoretical molecular weight of the yeast NAP1 dimer, that's calculated from the sequence of yeast SNAP1, and that is 103.6 kilodalton. And as you can see that um, when we compare numbers to numbers, we see that the yeast SNAP1 is a dimer at 300 millimolar NaCl. Here you also see that the black trace is perfectly flat and rests on top of the dimeric line, which means that the entire species in the black trace is homogeneous uh, yeast SNAP1 dimer. That's how we're going to look at the data, and we're going to do comparisons with our worm NAP1. Here we're going to talk about how salt concentration affects the worm and yeast NAP1 oligomerization. We see that at 300 millimolar NaCl, both worm NAP1 and yeast NAP1 are dimers. We can tell because the molecular weight trace for both worm NAP1 and yeast NAP1 rest on the dimeric theoretical molecular weight line and is fairly flat and represents a homogeneous species. However, when we do the same experiment at 150 millimolar NaCl, we see that warm NAP1 as well as yeast NAP1 exhibit a shift in the peak, which indicates larger species being formed. And under the peak, we see the gray trace of molecular weight not sitting on dimer, but instead hovering between dimer and tetramer, indicating that the population of NAP1, um, either be warm or yeast, is not fully dimer and not fully tetramer, but somewhere in between. So we say that the warm and the yeast NAP1 are dimers at 300 millimolar NaCl but exhibit a dimer tetramer equilibria at 150 millimolar NaCl. So, to explain the results, let's use a schematic. In green, we have warm NAP1, and you can see at 300 millimolar NaCl, it is a dimer, the two monomers being here and here. Uh, similarly, yeast NAP1 is shown in wheat, and is also a dimer at 300 millimolar NaCl. However, at 150 millimolar NaCl, both worm and yeast NAP1 exhibit a dimer tetramer equilibrium, where we observe that the dimer is the major species and forms a little bit of tetramer. That's why it's um, in a transparent shade. Um, so that is how salt concentration affects yeast and worm NAP1 oligomerization. We next investigated the oligomerization of the NAP1 histone complexes. NAP1, as you all know, is a histone chaperone and interacts with all the histones.
So we wanted to characterize our new NAP uh, ortholog, the worm NAP one, and compare it to yeast NAP one. Let me give you a little bit of background about the histones. Histones are basic proteins that make up the core of the nucleosome. There are two copies of H3, H4, shown in blue and green, and two copies of H2A and H2B, shown in yellow and red, together form an octomer, and DNA wraps around this octomer, forming the nucleosome. The nucleosome is a structural and functional unit of chromatin, and nucleosome assembly proteins, or NAPs, bind to these histones and regulate nucleosome assembly and disassembly. Overall, they regulate chromatin architecture, and are important for different uh, nuclear activities. Histones can exist as separate entities by themselves um, and are stable. Histones H3 and H4 form a heterotetramer, and we will represent it using this cartoon in the talk. And histones H2A, H2B form a heterodimer, and we will represent it like this throughout the talk. We learned previously that NAP proteins are constitutive homodimers and like to oligomerize in a salt-dependent manner. Now, we are going to study the oligomerization of NAP1 histone complexes using SECMOS and try and uh, determine the stoichiometry of these complexes. To understand the oligomerization and stoichiometry of NAP1 histone complexes, let me walk you through an experimental design. In the SECMAL system, we first inject 20 micromolar of NAP in a column pre-equilibrated with 300 millimolar NaCl. Our next sample is going to be NAP, but with titrations of H2A, H2B, or H3, H4. Our samples will include titrations in molar equivalents of 0.5 in blue, 1 in green, 1.5 in orange, and 2 in red. Once we obtain the uh, chromatograms, we see that uh, not only is there an increase in the height of the peak, but also the peak shifts to the left, indicating a large complex being formed. If this wasn't obvious enough, we also have molecular weight traces over here, which increase we compare our molecular weight traces to the theoretical molecular weight of NAP histone complexes, either 2 to 1 NAP histone or 2 to 2 NAP histone complexes, and we can make comparisons um, and identify stoichiometry of our protein complexes. Here I'm going to be talking about how worm NAP1 binds H to H to B differently than yeast NAP1. We see that when we titrate H2H2B to worm NAP1, the peak shifts to the left, indicating that a larger complex is being formed. And initially, there is an increase in the height of the peak, but eventually reaches saturation at the higher titration points. Along with that, we see that the molecular weight trace reaches a 2 to 1 NAP H2A H2B stoichiometry complex. Um, upon further titration beyond a uh, equimolar amount, we see that um, orange, which is 1.5, and red, which is two molar equivalents, we see that there is emergence of a free H2A H2B peak. Um, we do not uh, get a molecular weight trace of the H2A H2B peak because these proteins have low signal and are small, hence the error associated with it is slightly higher and we do not report them. However, we are confident because it is just a two protein system that it is H2H2B that is coming out. Along with that, we compare it to yeast NAP1 and see that um, it's different. When we titrate our H2H2B, we see that the peak height consistently increases and not only that but then the molecular weight first hits a 2 to 1 stoichiometry of NAP H2H2B 
but eventually starts approaching a 2 to 2 complex, but doesn't hit saturation, uh, which indicates that um, the yeast NAP1 is able to bind a second copy of H2H2B, but the complexes are very dynamic and there is constant exchange between a 2 to 1 and a 2 to 2 eSNAP1 H2H2B complex. Um, to conclude, we can say that the worm NAP1 has a complex stoichiometry of 2 to 1 with H2H2B. However, eSNAP1 can have a 2 to 2 stoichiometry or a 2 to 1 stoichiometry. Here we represent the previous SECMAS data in a simple schematic. In green we have warm NAP1 and as you can see it binds to one copy of H2H2B whereas in wheat we have yeast NAP1 binding to one or two copies of H2H2B. We observe no oligomerization of the NAP1 H2H2B complexes in either case but an important difference is that here in yeast NAP1 because of the presence of the N and the C terminal NAP tails, there is a second copy of H2H2B being bound, leading to a 2 to 2 stoichiometry. However, warm NAP1 naturally lacks an N terminal tail and possesses a very short C terminal tail, and hence cannot bind to a second copy of H2A H2B, which suggests that an extra H2H2B binding site is present on the acidic nap tail. Next, I'm going to be talking about how warm nap1 and yeast nap1 interact with H3H4. As you can see, when we titrate H3H4 to warm nap1, we see that there is a large shift in the peak as well as an increase when we move up the titration. This itself just indicates that a large protein complex is being formed. However, when we look at the molecular weight traces, we see that the molecular weight traces approach a 4 to 2 complex in the beginning of the titration, and as we move further down, we see the stoichiometry reaching a 4 to 6 NAP1 H3H4 complex. Similarly, even in yeast NAP1, we observe the same trend where we see a large shift in the peak, increase in peak height, as well as the stoichiometry reaching a 4 to 6 NAP1 H3H4 complex. It's interesting to note that both the NAP proteins behave similarly and oligomerize with H3H4, and we hypothesize that the protein species under the peak form a hetero heterogeneous mix and are constantly exchanging um, between different states. It is difficult to visualize a 4 to 2 or a 4 to 6 NAP1 histone complex and that is why I have made a simple schematic to illustrate this. Here in green we see four worm NAP1s, 1, 2, 3, 4, bound to two H3H4s, 1, 2, which is a 4 to 2 complex. However, as you saw, when we titrate H3H4 further, we end up with a 4 to 6 complex, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 NAPs, bound to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 H3H4s, which is a 4 to 6 stoichiometry. Um, both the warm nap ones as well as yeast nap one bind H3H4 similarly, that is, both of them oligomerize with H3H4 and have a stoichiometry range between 4 to 2, 2 4 to 6. Um, it's interesting to note that um, their H2A H2B binding mode is different in these two nap proteins because warm nap one binds to H2A H2B at a 2 to 1 stoichiometry, whereas yeast NAP1 binds to H2H2B at a 2 to 2 or a 2 to 1 stoichiometry, whereas in H3H4, both the NAP proteins tend to oligomerize. And we predict that the oligomerization is mediated by an H3H4 tetramerization interface. So 
we are going to try and determine the absolute stoichiometry of these NAP proteins with H3, H4. To understand the absolute stoichiometry of the NAP1 histone complex, especially the NAP1 H3, H4 complex, we mutate the tetramerizing interface of H3, H4 and test our hypothesis and study its effect on the NAP1 histone complex oligomerization. We saw that NAP1 binds to H3, H4 and forms higher order oligomers of stoichiometries ranging from 4 to 2 to 4 to 6 NAP1 H3, H4 complexes. To understand the absolute stoichiometry of NAP1 and H3, H4 better, we created a mutation in the H3, H3 interface, which is zoomed in over here. We cause mutations at cysteine 110, leucine 126, and isoleucine 130 position and change them to alanines and observe that H3, H4 cannot tetramerize anymore and they're exclusively dimeric. We call this H3, H4 mutant DMH3, H4 or dimeric mutant H3, H4. We then perform SECMAS experiments similar to previous and see the oligomerization and the stoichiometry of the NAP1 DMH3H4 complexes. So our prediction turned out to be true. Um, the complex uh, of NAP1 and H3H4 uh, oligomerizes because of the H3 tetramerization. Here is the SECMAS data to show you. We see that when we titrate our DMH3H4 to our worm or yeast SNAP1, we see that initially we get a 2 to 1 complex, but upon further titration, we see that the complex approaches a 2 to 2 stoichiometry for both these SNAP proteins. Both of them um, form a 2 to 2 stoichiometry. Um, but what you don't see here is that we don't observe the 4 to 2 and the 4 to 6 oligomerization which meant that uh, the, the mutation that we made on H3, H4 uh, abolished not only the H3, H4 tetramerization, but also the higher order oligomerization that we observed uh, with NAP1, H3, H4. Um, and similarly, uh, we saw that the worm and yeast NAP1 both behave the same. Uh, their stoichiometries are both 2 to 2 with the DMH3H4. To summarize this talk, in this study, we biochemically and structurally characterize NAP1 from C. elegans, or worm NAP1, shown in green. Its structure is almost identical to the yeast NAP1's core domain, which is shown in wheat. Yeast NAP1 possesses an acidic N and C terminal tail, whereas worm NAP1 naturally lacks its N terminal tail and only has a short C terminal tail. Because of its high sequence conservation in the core domain, we thought that worm NAP1 would be a great model protein to study and investigate the role of the tails in NAP1 self oligomerization, histone binding, and stoichiometries of histone bound complexes. Using SECMALS, we reveal that warm NAP1 can bind only one copy of H2A-H2B, whereas yeast NAP1 can bind one or two copies of H2A-H2B. The study suggests that the second copy of H2A-H2B can be bound by the N or the C terminal tail that is present in yeast NAP1. When the NAP proteins bind H3, H4, they form higher order oligomeric complexes in the order of 4 to 2 or 4 to 6 stoichiometries. This is both similar in worm as well as yeast SNAP1. We hypothesize that the binding interface of tetramerization of H3, H4 is causing this large oligomeric complex to form. When we mutate them uh, to uh, form exclusively dimeric H3H4. We observe that uh, 
we lose the oligomerization of NAP histone complexes and reveal an absolute stoichiometry of NAP, hist NAP H3H4 2 to 2 complex, both in warm NAP1 as well as in East NAP1. Thanks, Pritt. That was quite a lot of Zegmal's data. If we just take a second now to zoom out, I think we can appreciate that Sekmal's very straightforward approach has provided quite a lot of insight into how NAPs bind histones. To be a little bit more general, Sekmal's has enabled us to characterize the native oligomeric state of our proteins and their complexes. We didn't have a very straightforward system as we had high affinity oligomers, dynamic self-association, and a dependence on buffer conditions but we were able to get a handle on all of these by using SECMALS. Possibly the most important thing, however, was that SECMALS gave us the absolute stoichiometry of our complexes. We were able to get this by incubating and analyzing over a series of stoichiometric ratios. Now this is noteworthy as most other techniques really only determine uh, stoichiometric or relative ratios rather than absolute stoichiometry. This was really important for NAP proteins and histone proteins as several of them um, were already known to oligomerize um, both inside and outside of their complex. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the people involved in and that supported this work. First, of course, there's Pritt, who you heard from earlier in this talk. He worked closely with another graduate student, Nai Fu, to collect all of the SECMALS data. Uh, Kala and Sudipta were also involved in protein purification and a lot of the crystallographic analysis of WormNAP1. We've had the SECMALS instrument in our lab for just a few years. Um, it's in almost constant use and the students know how to use it thanks to the Wyatt Light Scattering University, um, which Pritt attended and found extremely useful. This work was supported by startup funds to myself uh, from the University of Texas at Dallas. And you, if you're interested um, in what else we do in our lab, you can visit our website just here. Thank you. And I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, well, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank our speakers for their presentations. And, uh, so here's the first one. Um, what uh, set column is used for your analysis? So we are using the GE SuperDex 200 um, column, the 10300 GL increase. That's the column that we use for our SECMOS analysis. Right, thanks. Here's the next question. Can we investigate in a similar way the protein DNA interaction by SECMOS? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Yes, we can actually. We can measure uh, the 260 nanometer wavelength uh, to uh, measure DNA. And then for the protein, we can go for the 280 or nanometers as well as the refractive index. And we can definitely do the same experiment and investigate protein DNA interactions with SECMALS. OK, thanks. So how can the MALS be explained as tetramer? even if the MALS signal is fairly far away from the tetramer line? Maybe a trimer? Yes. So um, for most systems, uh, uh, we would agree with that. But uh, if you notice, uh, the NAP proteins that we work with are constitutive dimers. So it could only go from t dimer, tetramer, hexamer, et cetera. So there isn't a possibility of it being a trimer. Um, the why it's a, why the line is in between a dimer and tetramer is because that these proteins are in constant exchange with these two states, so they're in dynamic equilibrium, and that is why the line is increasing from um, dim, uh, dimer to tetramer and is in between. It's a heterog heterogeneous mix. Okay, thank you. So about the fo first oligomer shown, why is the MALS graphic showing a continuous line between the molecular weight of tetramer and dimer instead of two lines at the same elution volume corresponding to the tetramer and the dimer? So yes, um, again, it's because that these, the dimeric and the tetrameric species are in constant exchange. 
Oh, and one thing is that the SECMAS uh, system gives us a weight average um, of, the, of the molecular weights across the peak, so we don't get two separate lines on the same elution volume. We're going to have one line, which is a weight averaged molecular weight. Okay, thank you. So some of your chromatograms show significant aggregate present. Are you considering higher order uglomerization, or, uh, or, how, or what do you make of the aggregate populations and how they vary? Um, so the aggregates, um, I don't, we do not have any aggregates present in our sample. We have larger oligomeric species because uh, our void volumes, like if we had an aggregate, it would come out in the, in the void volume of the column. And um, so far, I, the chromatograms do not have any aggregates in them. Okay, thank you. So, so what is the molecular weight of the largest complexes? Are you approaching the void volume of the superdex column? Uh, yeah, the, the molecular weight of the largest complex was about um, 200 to 50 kilodaltons, and um, yeah, like the previous question, it, 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 if it was larger, it would have, if it was an aggregate, it would have come out in the void volume of the column, okay. but it didn't, Thank yeah. You. All right, uh, here's the next question. So did you have any issues with aggregation that impacted your SECMOLS analysis? And if yes, how did you overcome them? So um, yes, uh, sometimes when you have uh, aggregation in your sample, you can see cloudiness or precipitation, which can be easily avoided. You wouldn't want to inject that onto your column. You would just uh, do a spin to centrifuge your samples before loading it onto your um, SECMOS. Thanks. So what factors to, or should be considered to lower the error percentage with the molecular weight obtained from SECMOLs? Um, the easiest way to uh, have good, um, nice errors with your molecular weights is to equilibrate the column as well as the SECMOL system for a long time, from about like two hours to sometimes even overnight. The longer the system is equilibrated, the better the baselines are, which reduces the error. Um, as well as if you have um, pro like a high protein concentration, your signal is much better compared to the noise. Okay, thank you. All right, this next question has a few parts to it. So, oh, are okay, you concerned? Yeah. Are, are you concerned that the column matrix interactions could tr confound your results? How can you confirm that these complexes exist in solution? And have you considered composition gradient models? So uh, we confirmed our interactions with uh, analytical ultracentrifugation at both the salts and with the relevant titrations. Then um, uh, what is the other parts are? Have you confirmed? Okay. Have you yes, considered? These complex, yeah. Um, these complexes ha exist in solution. There are a couple of papers out there um, with in vivo as well as in vitro work uh, with the NAP histone proteins, and then. We have not um, actually considered composition gradient sec models, but we could. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, here's another question for you. So why is there a peak of H2A, H2B, and not H3, H4, when histones are present above an equ equimolar ratio in the sec models chromatogram? So yes. Um, we see that when we add the H2A, H2B to our NAP protein, uh, we observe that beyond an equimolar or beyond the relevant ratio, we see that free, we see free H2A, H2B, H2B come out in the column as a peak, but with H3, H4, at least the wild type, uh, to, to the highest titration point we added was all bound to the NAP protein, which resulted in higher, oligo, higher order oligomeric complexes. Um, and then to a certain um, sometimes the histone proteins, they're very polar and they tend to stick to the column. So that's probably why it uh, also didn't elute. And even if they did, they're, um, the light scattering would be really tiny because they're small proteins. Okay, thanks. Next question. Why do you use the refractive index detector instead of UV? Uh, that's a very good question. So uh, we can use the UV uh, 284 proteins, but uh, I much prefer to use the refractive index detector because uh, 
especially for this study because histone proteins are, um, they have a, a low aromatic residue composition, so they don't have a very strong 280 nanometer absorbance. So refractive index helps us overcome the limitations from the UV at 280 nanometers. We um, also, for studies which are not related to proteins, say for like sugars or small molecules which do not absorb at 280, refractive index is the choice, the much better option to go for. Okay, thank you. Next question. At 300 millimolar NaCl, both yeast and worm NAP1 proteins are shown to be dimeric but exhibit long tails in the SEC profile. Do those tails correspond to disassociation to monomers? And if not, why do they appear? So um, as I said before, the NAP proteins cannot exist as monomers. They are constitutive dimers. Uh, the tailing is most probably likely due to um, either a heterogeneous mix of like oligomerization as well as degradation. I, it's more likely it's the protein is degrading but that is probably why there is like a small tailing that's formed. Um, the molecular weights that we selected for the study are for a defined peak region, so we try and avoid including the tail. Okay, thank you. Um, oligomerization is concentration dependent. How sensitive are your results to the specific sample concentration that is measured? And would you find different results at higher or lower concentrations than the one you measured? Yes, so uh, oligomerization is concentration dependent. Um, the, the study, the entire study was done at uh, 20 micromolar of protein, which is uh, the lowest concentration that the SECMAs uh, gave us the best signal to noise. Um, and yes, uh, concentration would affect the study for sure, because if we went into a higher concentration range, the NAP protein would oligomerize because they have a uh, concentration dependent oligomerization. So um, whatever res the titrations were done uh, were all done at the same concentration. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question for you. So how have the absolute stoichiometries determined by sec moles informed the interpretation of crystal structures of these complexes? Um, this is also a really good question. So um, uh, for example, I'll start with an example. Uh, the NAP1 H2H2B structure that's available currently by the PON group is uh, of the yeast NAP1 pore domain, which is a tailless construct of the yeast NAP1 protein, which is, in, uh, which is interacting with H2H2B. So that's what the crystal structure is available. Uh, however, we observe that in solution, like uh, experiments like SECMOS, we use full length proteins and we see that. There, there is some um, discrepancies and interesting results we observe with a wild type protein which has or doesn't have the tail like naturally. So um, yes, indeed, stoichiometries um, which we find through SECMOS would be great to set up our uh, protein complexes at the, at the right stoichiometry for setting up crystal trays for crystallization. Okay, thank you. We have one final question. So how do you know your protein is a constituent dimer for all conditions or in the presence of other proteins? Um, it's a known fact that the NAP1 protein is a dimer. There is a crystal structure available along with a lot of studies um, that show that the NAP protein um, is, d does not form a monomer. Uh, and the crystal structure shows the interactions all right. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank our speakers for their presentations and for taking the audience questions. I'd like to thank the audience for attending and participating in today's event. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Wyatt Technology, for making today's webcast possible. Thank you for joining us. See you next time, and have a good day.